First of all, Rachel Radomsky. She is the Executive Director and Head of Patient Advocacy and Engagement at Harmony Biosciences. And prior to joining Harmony in 2019, Rachel worked for Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Johnson & Johnson in various roles, including patient advocacy, federal and state public policy, and political engagement initiatives. She received her BA from Pennsylvania State University and her MA in government <laughs> with a speciality in health policy from the John Hopkins University. This is Rachel. <clears throat> Dr. Marcy Ross. Dr. Marcy Ross is the Director and Head of Alliance Development and Public Policy at Harmony Biosciences. With 20 years of healthcare experience, she joined Harmony Science Biosciences Medical Affairs team in 2018. And during her time in medical affairs, Dr. Ross established a strong peer-to-peer -peer relationships with clinicians and researchers in the rare neurological disease space. A dynamic and innovative approach to establishing genuine connections and sharing insights helped foster relationships between Harmony, Biosciences, and professional organizations and societies. Dr. Ross earned her Doctorate of Pharmacy at Howard University in Washington, DC, <laughs> where she currently resides with her husband and her two sons. And most importantly, she's a person with integrity and a deep love for advocating for people living with debilitating disorders. She's currently earning her certificate in social impact strategy in the executive program of UPenn. Welcome, Dr. Ross. And last but not least, um, Veronica is an Associate Director and Research Development Global Patient Advocate at Horizon Therapeutics. She has over 15 years combined experience in the rare disease arena, spanning from patient advocacy and engagement, health equity, community health education, patient recruitment, and Miss Moore is an active board member of the Hypersomnia Foundation. We win. <laughs> Love it. Um, she also serves as a patient engagement advisor for the Drug Information Association, Tufts University, Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, and at Duke University Clinical and Translational Science Institute. She's also a DEI advisor for RAREX and the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition and Black Women's Health Imperative. She's also a member of the North Carolina Serious Illness Coalition. Previously, she, earned, she served sorry, as a senior global patient advocacy and insights lead at IQVIA, where she developed patient engagement strategies for a number of global rare diseases and clinical trials. In that role, Veronica developed and maintained strategic relationships with advocacy organizations in various therapeutic areas, both globally and locally. Veronica has also served as the National Program Manager for the Genetic Disorders of Mucociliary Clearance Consortium at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is an active member of the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. Ms. Moore holds a Bachelor, Bachelor of Science from East Carolina in Public Health Studies and was awarded the university's 40 Under 40 Award for Distinguished Alumni in 2022. And she also hold, holds a Master's of Arts in Sociology from the North Carolina Central University. Well, welcome to these three women. <laughs> a lot of school. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome to our rare table talk. There's a table. <laughs> <laughs> table talk. And we imagine that this session was very important for us as a foundation and as the constituents of the Hypersomnia Foundation to really meet the faces, the passion, and the people behind the science. We see lovely logos of pharmaceutical companies and emails and communications and on social media, but it's important for us to meet the people and the passion behind that are driving science forward. So today we want to be aimed in shining light about what is patient centricity? What does it mean to be a patient-focused drug development leader and contributor to the science of rare sleep disorders. So today we have two SMEs in the space of patient advocacy and alliance development. Thank you Harmony Bioscience for your commitment to our community and really partnering with us as a true ally as we drive science forward together. So thank you for that. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I really wanna just get to know a little bit about you, who you are, what is patient advocacy? 
Um, I'll just kick it off just to get a little bit more flavor about who, who Rachel is, who is Marcy, yeah. um, and away from all these different titles and accolades. Like, who are you? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Radomsky. Um, I run patient advocacy at Harmony Biosciences. Um, and really what my job is, is to collaborate uh, with patient advocacy groups like the Hypersomnia Foundation and other groups in the sleep disorder space, other rare uh, national advocacy groups, um, and to represent the patient and caregiver perspective across cross-functional working teams within Harmony um, and create innovative uh, programs and solutions uh, that help benefit the patients and their families that we're trying to serve. Um, so on top of trying to do that at work, <laughs> um, I am a wife, um, I'm a mother, I have uh, two young children, uh, Brooks and Marlo, um, and then I have a very active Australian shepherd named Ivy, and I live in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, where I've been for the last eight years. So one of the things that I really love and I'm really extremely passionate about is advocacy. And so it really is the ecosystem of us all working together from uh, the people that are living with the disorders, uh, their families, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the advocacy groups, uh, the physicians that are here. And it's a corporate buzzword you hear all the time, but it's this ecosystem. Um, but it really is, it's a rising tide that lifts all boats um, in advocacy, and it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, the other thing that I uh, love and I get to bring to work every day, which you don't always think of in, in corporate America, is empathy. Um, and it's an empathy for um, the, the patients that we're working with or trying to serve, for my colleagues um, that I get the pleasure um, to work with. And I think it's really important for us in our job and what we do to just infuse empathy into the very fabric of the company and the employees as best as we can. Absolutely, absolutely. And Marcy, I mean, you're a dynamic it. duo. I love it. So <laughs> love to know about you and the work that you do and who you are. Yeah, uh, Rachel and I are paired very well in our personalities. Um, so for me, just I, I feel so grateful, so thankful to be invited, to be on stage in front of you, and, and to be a part of the community. And that is something that's very important at Harmony Biosciences. Uh, we were talking earlier, and uh, Rachel's like, yeah, Marcy the, is OG <laughs> at <laughs> Harmony. I um, started in 2018, and so I've been able to see our, um, our culture, which has always been patients are at the heart of everything we do. I've been able to see us live that, um, expand and grow and go through our peaks and valleys, but to do it still with that, um, patients are always at the heart of everything we do. Um, for me, I'm just, again, very thankful to be on the stage, very um, grateful to hear, to be um, in this sacred space where you got everyone's being so vulnerable and so open. Uh, it's a very much a shared space. When I was at lunch, um, Chris was uh, talking about how unique this space is because you have, end, you have uh, healthcare professionals, you have representatives from the pharmaceutical industry, you have people living with um, sleep disorders, all convening. And that's something unique that the Hypersomnia Foundation does very, very well. And so my role as uh, Alliance, head of Alliance Development, as you can imagine, is to build alliances. Um, very similar to what Rachel does in advocacy, I do this with healthcare professionals, but also professional societies and not-for-profit not organizations. Um, as you can imagine, um, after um, you know, thinking about some of the challenges that we hear in the patient advocacy group, uh, a lot of it comes down to training. It comes down to the, the length of time it takes for a diagnosis. And so part of my job is to be in the rooms where um, they're having some of these conversations and if the, the voice of the patient's not there, if the, the sound of rare uh, sleep disorder is not there, um, I'm able to be in the room and make sure that that voice is heard. Um, professionally, I mean personally, I live in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm married uh, 17 years, a native Washingtonian. So we enjoy uh, life in the city with our two teenage boys. I won't go into detail what life is like up there, um, but we do have a dog as well, not as active as Ivy. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I feel that I'm a natural connector. And so for me, being in this space and um, being able to bring um, you know, insights from attending this meeting, and I'll be able to say this when I go into uh, meetings with uh, leadership at different organizations, it's, it's my dream job. It really is. It's very much connected to who I am as a human being, um, similar to, like I said, Rachel and I have paired very well. 
Absolutely. Patient advocacy is the perfect day job. <laughs> I always say that. Um, I think when we think about patient advocacy and having a head role of an ad, a patient advocacy role at an in, internal um, at an organization and being the internal champion, Rachel, yeah. what does that mean for the clinical operations team? And clinical operations in layman's term is kind of like the people behind the clinical trial execution and planning. Um, what does that mean for medical affairs, for the physicians and scientists that are collaborating with some of the physicians that are providing care to patients living with a rare sleep disorder? What does that mean for working with internal cross-functional partners mm -hmm. from a patient-centered approach? Yeah, thanks. And I think, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. It has to be, patient centricity doesn't just take, oh, you take one or two people, you give them this job title, and then now you're patient-centric at your company. It has to come um, really from the top down and be infused in through all layers of your company. So one of the things I love about Harmony is that we have a, a practicing neurologist as our CEO. Um, he was a clinician himself uh, for 10 years. Uh, Dr. Jeff Dano, um, he'll be here at the sleep meeting. Please say hi to him. If you see him, he'd love to meet you. Um, and it really, he sets the tone for making sure, um, you know, patient and caregiver voices and insight are crucial, are crucial to all levels of business. So why does this matter to, to this group of, of folks that are here today? Um, well, we need you. We need you to stand up and raise your hands um, and to volunteer and to be engaged with us because you're the ones that are bringing us the patient and caregiver insights. Um, so at, at Harmony, we've done a couple of things I'm, I'm proud of. Uh, in 2020, we organized something that we called the Summit on Sleep Disruption. Um, we put ourselves in Zoom boxes at that time. Um, and we brought together the narcolepsy community, the hypersomnia community, uh, the uh, KLS community. Um, Steve was there. Um, but then other um, disorders outside of just sleep disorders, disorders of central hypersomnolence, that also experience disrupted nighttime sleep or disordered sleep during the day. Um, people that are sleepy in the rare disease community. So that includes people living with Prader-Willi syndrome, with myotonic dystrophy, with Angelman syndrome, with Smith-McGinnis syndrome, and really started to build those patient insights um, into what it means to be a rare disease patient who is sleepy. Um, and we've infused that through a, a lot of the work that we do internally, but there's been a lot of great collaborations um, that we've uh, spun out of a, a sleep and rare project um, that we call it. Um, but we also do um, internal advisory boards um, where we sit and listen and hear from you um, on the impact of a sleep disorder on your life, on your loved one's life, before we've even designed a clinical trial. Um, so we can incorporate those patient insights into what a trial looks like. So what time is the best time um, to do assessments um, during your clinic visit? Do you have to go in for every clinic visit or can we do something with a home health nurse? Um, does the branding of this trial resonate with you or is that imagery maybe doesn't look exactly right? Um, you know, give us your feedback on it. And that's where it takes um, you know, people raising their hands um, and working with us. And it's, I'm so appreciative. I, I got to see so many people that I've met, again, in a Zoom box in the last two years here this week, which has been really exciting. Um, and then finally, one of the things that I was talking about before is just infusing that level of empathy into everyone we work with. Uh, so Marcy and I and a couple of our other colleagues, we get to come to a meeting like this and we get to hear your vulnerability and your stories and about what your life is like a lot of our colleagues don't. Um, so if you work in HR or you work in IT, um, or if you sit someplace else, you, you might have never met someone with narcolepsy. You might have never met someone with KLS, never met someone with IH. So Marcy and I get to tag team on what we call a fireside chat series, um, where we bring these stories into our company on um, pretty much a monthly basis. And I love that um, we just followed Julie and Lizzie because stories matter. Yeah. And when you're opening up your computer and logging onto your fourth or fifth or sixth <laughs> Zoom of the day, um, you may remember, uh, you know, oh my gosh, I heard Celia's story or I heard Lizzie's story. Um, and, you know, that's why we come to work every day. And so that's something um, that we need to collaborate with you all on. So, so please help us do that. Yes, amplifying the patient voice is so important. And I think just even to add on that very quickly is um, you guys are in terms of, I do a lot of in terms of inclusion and diversity and in the spaces of, in terms of health disparities. But as you guys are in um, different rooms and you have, you're engaging with um, any other minoritized groups or um, that may not be as comfortable with clinical trials or raising their hand, um, you can also be their influencer and their advocate for them, you know, and to usher other communities into the space. 
which is really important. Absolutely. On that point, uh, Marcy, you know, in the Alliance Development and Patient Advocacy piece, what is Harmony doing as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, that's paired with patient advocacy? What are some things that you guys have maybe done or thinking about doing to making sure that we're bringing all patients from all walks of life to the table or give them access or even pipeline as far as diversifying staff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll start, and then maybe you can jump yes. in, because I'm going um, to tout you. So I think yeah. on the external side, um, one of the things I, uh, I think we're really proud of is that in 2021, we started a program at Harmony Biosciences called Progress at the Heart. Um, and so it's an external funding program, um, and it, what it does is it addresses uh, inequities in the sleep disorder and other rare uh, neurological space. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't, I'm not sure there is, is another program that's working on um, health equity, uh, and we've been able to fund programs uh, across the nonprofit space, but also in academia. It's been really exciting, um, and so that's something I'm extremely proud of. Um, but to Marcy's earlier point, and Progress at the Heart was Marcy's idea that, <laughs> that um, she brought um, to us, and so you know, it's just been a, an amazing way to get immersed in, into that community. But I also think in terms of diversifying research, um, I want to applaud uh, the, the Hypersomnia Foundation because I think you all have done a great job of looking yes. inward and saying, um, you know, every part of this ecosystem needs to think about equality and diversity. And, um, you know, I know you've worked to diversify, you know, your board and, you know, done some internal studies. Um, and so help us do that too. You know, we can't diversify our clinical research, which is something that's really important to a company like Harmony unless there are patients out there that are willing to raise their hand and get engaged and get involved. Um, so that's something that's you know, really important and crucial. Yeah, I, I love that. And this year, um, we just uh, closed our round one for Progress at the Heart. Um, we have a record number of applications. And so it shows you that we are building those connections, which is really important. Um, and uh, Veronica and I had an opportunity to attend the first ever uh, Duke and North Carolina Central University, which is Veronica's alma mater, uh, Neuroscience Career Day. And so for us, um, we understand that we try to connect with clinicians and with um, allies who are innovative. Um, we understand that innovation doesn't happen without risk, and we are right there um, taking those risks with our um, allies and, and with our partners. And so we had a clinician um, who I've had a longstanding relationship with um, and really trust his um, innovation. He actually works at Duke and uh, as their chair of DEI since 2018. So before it was a buzzword, you know, really his heart is in advocacy and he came to us and, and had this idea to connect a historically black college and university that's three miles away from Duke, but they didn't ever have this opportunity to collaborate. And for us, it's being there, being in the community with um, clinicians who, to me, are provider advocates. Um, they really do, again, have a, um, a heart for advocacy. And so we were able to um, share in that experience, uh, um, was able to talk about what it's like to be a pharmacist. And um, uh, Veronica was able to speak on her experience. We were in the room with so many different professionals in neuroscience. But that is how we, um, as an organization, um, you know, support the uh, pipeline of what's coming next for uh, healthcare professionals. Make sure that it's diverse and it has different voices and different lived experiences. So for us, that feels very authentic to what we do as a company. Absolutely. I think showing up and being present and being part of the conversation is so critical. Um, I appreciate that all of our sponsors in the pharma ed industry don't just cut checks. Okay. We show up, yes. discuss, conversate with, you know, patients from all walks of life, care partners, supporters from all walks of life, because it really matters having those one-to-one -one conversations at lunch or in the coffee stand um, outside, and really making sure that you, knowing that your voice is being taken back and your experience is taken back to the team and to be considered as they're going and moving forward science in an equitable um, and compliant way as well. I think the other piece that we think about um, as far as Harmony and other biotech companies is that well, even when there's not anything to present for late breaking data or information, there's always an opportunity to share experiences, roles, mm -hmm. responsibilities, and how people are contributing to the science. So I would just challenge the audience that 
continuing, even if it's not a clinical trial, if it's just a survey around quality of life, if it's a survey around the role of a support partner, we will love for you to continue to drive science forward, even if it's not an interventional study, because that information still helps us move the science forward in a collective way. And all of this information we're collecting is helping one another, academia, pharma, um, new investigators that may have piqued interest in this area, we're all taking this knowledge and information forward to move the needle um, in this way. Rachel and Marcy, did you have anything that you wanted to add regarding um, Harmony or the work that you're doing or any big takeaways from today's session around the experience and patient centricity at all? Any last nuggets? I just wanted to say, I think one of, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said um, this area of advocacy and policy and collaboration in terms of participating and raise your, raising your hand to participate in research, in, whether it's a clinical trial or that is something where um, you know Harmony, as well as all the other companies that are here, we're all working together on. And so this is the, the spirit of collaboration as we try to work on um, you know, advancing research and science is really strong and important in, in advocacy and policy. And so it's just something I'm really proud of. Um, and I, you know, I love what I do. So thank you for letting me work in your community. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo those sentiments. I love what you said when you said rising, rising tides lifts off boats. Yes. Um, and, and that's how we were very collaborative. Um, I came from medical affairs, um, which is also very collaborative, and you get to share this, the science and um, to help educate. Um, in my role as Alliance Development, I really get to, again, take these insights back um, and take them, them into different forums and help and hold them accountable. Um, be in the room with leaders and ask them, have you um, had this program? Last year, um, the uh, APSS meeting, um, which is happening um, a few days from now, um, to me it did something very innovative. They had um, a panel with all of the uh, sleep advo patient advocacy yeah, groups. That's, um, that's innovation and that comes from um, making sure that everyone's at the table. Industry has to be at the table um, as well as these professional organizations as well as healthcare providers independently have to be at the table with the right heart and that is to keep patients at the heart of everything that they do. And if we continue to, to be in these rooms, which we're so grateful to be in, um, we can, again, hear uh, firsthand um, your perspective, hear firsthand um, how you're impacted by some of these decisions. And um, you can see that Rachel and I are not shy. <laughs> um, we're definitely vocal um, in, these, in the rooms that we're in. So um, we just want you to know that your, your partnership and being a part of this community um, really means everything to us as an organization from the top down. Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. I think in closing for our little chatter here, but we'll be opening it up for questions if we have time, is the shared accountability piece that if you see something with marketing materials from any pharmaceutical company that does not resonate with you, please use the Hypersomnia Foundation as a channel of communication. Um, if there's something that you really want to amplify that you think that's clinically important, if anyone designing a clinical trial or a survey instrument that these are key questions that are important to my community, Feel free to raise your hand and reach out to us. We want to serve as board members and, and employees of the foundation as a vehicle of voice for you to connect to the researchers. So please know that our doors always open. We love your insight, your honest feedback, and it's that whole shared accountability. If you know something, say something. That applies to science as well. If something's not going well or something can be improved, um, it's a shared accountability among both, both ends. Um, in that way, and it's truly a collaborative effort. And I appreciate everyone's robust and authentic conversations this weekend. I appreciate Harmony and all of our biotech companies, partners, um, and your commitment to this community because we know it is a huge commitment to commit to rare sleep um, in this way. It's not nice and sexy like diabetes. <laughs> But we know that this is very important. It's just as important as some of these chronic diseases. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. All. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Now they have to come to this table. All right, so we've got a couple of minutes if you wanted to direct a question at us uh, regarding anything that came up during that session or about the Hypersomnia Foundation. Um, 
Before we do that, I want to just draw your attention to a typo in the breakout, which is the KLS Foundation a breakout room is actually the Renaissance, which is just to the right. So apologies there for that saying, the Alexander. Um, and then we'll take a little break before breakouts and resume in our various spaces at 3.15. But has anyone got a question for um, either Veronica or myself? I'm going to have to throw the mic. There's a question. Okay. Lisa. So I know one of the things that we talked about this morning was disseminating knowledge, um, both to patients and to support people. And your comment about the collaborative panel between all of the different um, patient support organizations brought to mind a question. Is there kind of a single Sorry, good it question. From a yeah. Biotech and from an advocacy okay. group. So I can take it from two angles. Um, full disclosure: I work for a biotech company that is not affiliated in the sleep space. So I can speak from this from a broad lived experience piece. Often biotech companies, when they go into a physician's office, as part of their strategy, is also to offer those um, physicians or medical the staff, a resource guide of all the advocacy groups that are supporting that disease state. So I'm pretty sure that's happening um, across a lot of our biotech companies. They also have medical science liaisons in certain territories and regions, which are really dialed in if any of the groups have any regional-based activities going on in their areas, um, if there's any local events like the Philadelphia event in, in Seattle. I'm pretty sure the medical science liaisons are aware of that, and they could disseminate that to the physician and medical community and trickle down as well. On the patient advocacy side, um, the foundation also has a medical scientific review, um, committee and also people on the board are connected to so a lot of physicians across the U.S. And every time we get a moment to share the wealth of information, not just Hypersomnia Foundation, but other organizations, we re make sure to make sure, be sure to share that this physician knows of all the host of organizations that are providing said resources. But I will tell you, based on my lived experience, the best way to get information to patients is from another patient. That has been the most impactful way for patients to hear around resources that have been meaningful to them, that has added value. So whenever you're in the physician's office and you come across another patient with KLS, or you come across a patient with hypersomnia, smile, nod, go over, reach, chat with them, because odds are they haven't heard about us. Um, and the physicians have so much on their plate. I mean, let's be honest, sometimes it's a lot where they want to spend a lot of time with you clinically to give you your answers. But that peer-to-peer -peer time and that peer-to-peer -peer connection is invaluable. So really challenge everyone when you see another patient in a clinic office. Smile. Have you heard of the Hypersomnia Foundation? <laughs> um, or if you have information, feel free to send your docs to us. We'll have a chat with them. We have a board of how many people now? We have a whole crew. Like We can all divide and conquer and have some one-on-one -on -one time with the physicians as well. So reach out. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Quinn. Well, I, I'm apparently I'm mic'd, so. Oh, you're on a mic. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, I saw a proposal recently uh, ab about paying clinical trial participants more, or sometimes more than zero, uh, as a mechanism of increasing diversity in clinical trial participants. Now, I thought, I, when I saw that, I thought that, that could work. But there are probably other big ideas that could ha also have a positive impact there. What do you think are some of those big ideas? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so full disclosure, the FDA has laid out some guidance regarding diversity in clinical trials. You can go on the FDA site and see the whole write-up of all the guidance there. Um, incentivizing has been a big thing because time away from work, lost wages, in pertain, as it pertains to time away and the commitment for diversity, diverse populations participating in research. But to answer your second part of the question, first part of the question is, 
fair, fair market value, that there's now calculators and system, systematic um, systems online that you can go, researchers can make sure that they're paying patients in an equitable fashion. So kudos to the teams, like National Health Council is really pushing that. They have an FMV calculator you can go on and they can go and calculate how much you should be compensating patients according to how much you're asking of them to do. Uh, the second part is, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion piece is that there are other accommodations aside from race and gender, because race is a social construct, but patients that identify as a disabled individual or other appropriate accommodations that elder care, for example, there are individuals that are participating in rare disease clinical trials that do not have elder care. And physicians are asking their patients to spend six, seven hours in a clinic visit where they have an aging parent at home. So a elder care could be another accommodation that we can do to move that needle, knowing that we have a growing and aging population. And especially in the diverse communities, sometimes there's cultural norms where you have a, a concept of aging in place and aging at home. The other component is child care and elder care and also transportation. We know there are patients in rural um, areas that have transportation barriers to getting access to clinical trials. So there's a lot of partnerships with Lyft and Uber now with clinical trial teams and sites and also industry institutions that are putting in accommodations in a concierge way to provide Uber and Lyft and other transportation needs to support some of those barriers as well. I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you, and see you in a few minutes.